12 years ago was my first year at one of our schools as a teacher. I had taught for two years in a comprehensive public high school. I taught a, re a remedial English class. I taught an AP English class. I taught an English language learner class, and I was the yearbook guy. Um, and then I came to this school um, when we were opening um, one of our schools. And to help us get started, um, Ron came and ran, I think, a one-day PD session where he brought a lot of student work. Um, and in that, I, st I mean, I still really actually remember literally which pieces of student work I was holding. Um, I had already seen a, a fairly famous project from HTH, which is on one of the cards that you have. It's, it's the, the, the guide to the bay over here. It was called Perspectives, um, uh, a high school in, um, humanities class and biology class produced an absolutely beautiful professional field guide to the San Diego Bay. Um, my instinct had been that they probably saw a field guide and decided to do that. In the PD session with Ron, what I realized was that, was that they were doing a tribute project. There was an elementary school that had done a field guide to the local flora and fauna around the school. And a middle school had seen that project and done a sort of a tribute to it and done it at the middle school level. And then some folks at HTH saw that project and they took it to the high school level. And in that same session, Ron was describing a, a well water quality project um, where elementary students were testing well water in their local community and I think sending letters to the homeowners describing what was or was not in the water. Um, and that they had followed the standards in the EPA manual and they had done everything as if they were adults. Their definition of rigor was not like how much they covered, but it was to what extent are they doing the work of adult professionals? How close is their work to that standard? Um, and instantly, like literally in under one second, whatever the fastest time in the tennis ball challenge was, that's how long it took for me to plan what became one of my favorite projects ever, which was a biology and humanities project where we were testing water from San Diego's beaches, rivers, and bays, and we were acting as a, as a, a nonprofit, essentially, that tries to find out what's in the water. We try to figure out who's responsible for it, and we try to accurately tell the story back to either the citizens or other interested nonprofits or local governmental agencies. Um, my project really was a tribute project that was inspired by an elementary project. Um, and I heard about another project where elementary students were documenting the presence of salamanders in, um, I think it was in a forest near their school, is that right? And they were finding, what they found was that basically there was a certain species of salamander that was, they were surprised to find was there. And they were informed by local adults that that, I think, was it local adults or was it adults at the EPA in DC? The state let them know that they were incorrect, that those salamanders were not there. And someone from the state went to go see what these elementary school students were doing, and they found out that the elementary school students had accurately documented the presence of a specific species of salamander in a place where no one else had ever known that it lived. And as soon as I saw that student work, I was like, I want to do that. So ladies and gentlemen, Ron Berger. Thank you, Randy. Um, so I'm Ron Berger. I come from New England. There's two feet of snow at my house that my wife has been shoveling, letting me know that um, I deserted her. Um, but I got out just in time to come see you all. So I have a, a very strangely simple vision of school. My vision of school is that students should make things. Those things should be high quality. And then they should be sharing those things and speaking about what they learned in making them. And when I say things, I'm talking about essays, scientific reports, mathematical solutions. I'm talking about blueprints, buildings, sculptures all kinds of things, things that they're crafting with their hands, things that they're using their brains primarily to build, things that they're doing by hand, craftsmanship, and by computer. Once students are done with school, 
and enter their adult life, they are never again judged by test scores. For the rest of their life, they're judged by the quality of work they do and the quality of person that they are. Why is it that all we focus on in this country when kids are younger are their test scores, when for the rest of their life, that's not what matters? So my message has been the same simplistic, dumb message for 40 years of education. My mission has been, can we focus on the work kids do in schools to make it high quality work? And have kids be proud of what they do and share that work. Some of that work is going to be project work, but it doesn't have to even be project work. When kids write a poem or an essay or do a mathematical solution that's brilliant, that's beautiful, that's well done, they should be proud of it, they should be sharing it beyond their classroom, and they should be able to talk about what they learned doing it. Whatever your discipline is, whatever your role is in your school, my obsession is not around projects, just to say. It's around quality. It's like, can we focus on quality? And I'm not talking about quality test scores. I'm talking about quality work in whatever domain you work in. So what I want to do is share with you thoughts today about students doing high quality work. I'm going to back up a little bit and sort of tell you sort of where I come from. So right now I write books and I speak and I help to run an organization that works ar across the country trying to help public schools. We have, uh, the organization is called EL Education. We used to be called Expeditionary Learning. We work with about 150 partner schools around the country. And we produce free resources for, for teachers everywhere. We're a nonprofit that's just trying to spread the word. We're trying to change the conversation about school so that it's not just about test scores anymore. We are trying mostly to change the definition of what student achievement means in this country. Right now when people say that we use the word student achievement, you know what they mean. They mean test scores. Like that's all they mean. Student achievement means test scores. If a newspaper in your town or city has an article about a high achieving school, you know what that means. High test scores. That's all it means. We're saying that student achievement actually has three dimensions. And so our three-dimensional view of student achievement, first is sort of mastery of academic content and skills, which doesn't mean test scores. It means knowing your math, knowing your science, knowing your history, being a good writer. But that's only a third of our vision. The second part is character. What kind of human beings are we creating in our schools? Our schools were made, founded in this country. Public education was founded in this country to make citizens that would be the people we want to live with, that would, we would want to have running our country. The character of those people matters. And lastly, high quality work. We want craftspeople in our schools. We want kids who take pride in what they do. The kind of kids that you'd want to hire if you were an adult business person. So when we ask our schools to be credentialed by our organization, those schools have to bring a portfolio to show their success in all of those areas. They have to show that kids are becoming good human beings and that they have high quality work in addition to just doing well on academic assessments. And we're pushing every state and we're pushing federally wherever we can to change that conversation. High achieving does not mean test scores. It means all of these things. Let me tell you why that matters personally to me. I live in the middle of nowhere, okay? I live in a town that has no street lights. Most of the roads are dirt. My town has no stores. I built my own house in the woods. And for 25 years, I was the only sixth grade teacher in this town, which means every kid born in that town had me as a teacher which means in my town, anyone under the age of 50 is my former student. Okay? So that means that my nurse is my former student, my plumber is my former student, my electrician is my former student, the guy who plows my driveway this morning is my former student, the volunteer fire department are my former students, the half-time police person in my town is my former student. It really matters to me that these are good people who have integrity, whom I trust. I don't care what their test score was in third grade. What I care about is that nurse is the kind of nurse that's going to protect my life, that our firefighters in our town are the kind of men and women who are going to save me when I need them to. 
So I am living that reality where my former students are the people I depend on for my life. That's what America is about. That's what public schools are about. And even though your students, maybe in your towns, are not that small, so they spread a little more, it's still the students that are being educated now around where you live are the people you're going to be depending on. So we need to be thinking about those three dimensions. Let me show you my town. So my town is a typical New England town. I live in western Massachusetts. It's got a hill. On top of the hill, there's a church and a town common in front of it. In addition to the old white church, there is the post office. The post office is also Mary Dillman's home. You have to go into her home to get your mail. I taught Mary Dillman's kids. I taught Mary Dillman's grandkids. Everyone in town knows everybody's business, right? Because all the mail comes right in. There's the town hall, which used to be a two-room schoolhouse until I got there in the early 70s and the school was built. And the only business in our town is the Shootsbury Athletic Club. There are no elliptical trainers, no treadmills in this building. This is a bar. <laughs> if you want to know why it's called the Athletic Club, they watch a lot of sports in this bar. <laughs> half the year it's surrounded by pickup trucks, the other half of the year it's surrounded by snowmobiles, like right now when we had two feet of snow last night. So, let me build on Randy's story. It's a cool thing for me to have taught for 25 years in a public school in a town that has no government. What do I mean by no government? We have no mayor in town. When we make decisions in town, we have town meeting where everyone in town shows up in the one space that's big enough, which is the school gym, and they argue all day long about everything. And they have to come to a conclusion themselves in a pure democracy. So, Having a town that has no government means we don't have any people hired to do the work that other people in cities and towns do. So when the state of Massachusetts said, every town in the state, we would like you to do an amphibian survey. What amphibians live in your town? So if you were in Sacramento, you would hire a naturalist, a herpetologist, to go around and do sampling. We don't have any money for that. We had no money for anything. In fact, this is just to be clear. My starting salary was $7,200 for a full-time teaching job in 1976, $7,000. I worked as a carpenter for 25 years at the same time as I worked as a teacher, just so I could raise a family in this small town. So we had no money in this town, and yet we decided we had to do with this because the, we wanted to protect amphibians in the state. So third and fourth grade kids, became experts in amphibians, and during school, after school, and on weekends, they went into every swamp, every wetland, every stream, every lake, every part of woods and town, and collected amphibian specimens, larval and adult amphibians. And those kids learned how to identify every possible amphibian in its larval state and in its adult state in town. They photographed them, they weighed them, they measured them, and when they submitted their report to the state of Massachusetts, of all the amphibians that lived in town, they got a letter back from the state that said, dear third and fourth grade herpetologists, thank you for your report. You submitted more data than any town in the state of Massachusetts. Now, it wasn't a fair fight, right? Like, we had almost 40 third and fourth grade kids doing this, and everyone else had one person going around doing sound. And these kids did it all, every day, after school, weekends. Like, they were obsessed with collecting amphibians. So that was, but the state letter also said, as Randy mentioned, but we actually, we have to point out that you made two errors because two of the species that you listed in your town don't live in your town. And the kids were incensed, absolutely incensed. So the first thing we had to teach the kids is to how to write a respectful rebuttal letter. <laughs> so they wrote back to the state and they said, dear state of Massachusetts Environmental Protection Organization, we just want to let you know we appreciate your acknowledgement of our report and we respectfully disagree with your critique of our findings. We believe we have correctly identified these species. Here is our data, here are our photographs, here are our measurements, and we would like to meet with you in person. And the state actually did send out a state herpetologist who got lost trying to find our small town, eventually made it there. The kids brought him through the woods to a bog, and of course, as Randy mentioned, the kids were right. 
they had correctly identified these species. And they said, Mr. Berger, we're not just practicing to be scientists, we kind of are scientists now. And it was really clear to those kids as third and fourth graders that they were doing adult level work now and there's no reason why they couldn't. There's no reason why they had to have a lower standard for the quality of what they did than what any adult did. And since I'm so old, I can tell you that some of those kids are scientists now, remarkably. They created a field guide to the amphibians of our town. This is the cover of that field guide done by a third grader. Because they figured nobody knows what's in our town except us. We need a field guide for the amphibians of our town. And as Randy mentioned, I took that field guide to Portland, Maine, where middle school kids then made a field guide to Casco Bay in Portland, Maine. The students that made that field guide in Portland, Maine were from all over the world because it's a refugee settlement city. And this particular middle school had all the refugees. A third of the kids in that school are born in other countries. They speak 31 languages in that school. Every kid, whether they were born from in Somalia or Sudan or whether they were born in Portland, did a page in this field guide with some sea creature that they found and wrote about. Now imagine being a seventh grader in this town and going into the National Park Service gift shop or going into a local tourist shop and saying to your parents or your foster parents, this is our book. This is the book I wrote with my classmates. This is my page. I did this research. I did that illustration. This is me. Let me tell you, I was in public school for 13 years from kindergarten through 12th grade. There's nothing I did in 13 years of school that I still have and that I'd want to show you today. And yet these seventh graders, some of whom were in Somalia two years ago, already had something that people were buying in the National Park Service because it was so good. That's quality. And I will tell you that we didn't allow those kids to make those drawings by looking online and copying a jellyfish. Those kids had to actually put on wetsuits, which we borrowed, and use underwater cameras, which we borrowed, and actually photograph these things under the water. And let me tell you, main water is really tough. So these kids became scientists in order to do that high quality work, and it changed who they were as people. Because already as seventh graders, they had done something beautiful, something important. And as Randy mentioned, I brought that field guide around. I brought it to the lowest performing middle school in Massachusetts, in Springfield, Massachusetts, they said, we need to make a field guide to what was called the dump behind their school, which was a bog. They cleaned it out, built interpretive signs, and made a field guide to what's in the bog. Now, within three years, that went from the lowest performing middle school in the state of Massachusetts to district average. Not because of this project, because we did all kinds of literacy work with them, but this project was the thing that changed those students' pride in who they were. They were the kids in the worst school in the state, and then they were the kids who were in the paper for having produced this beautiful field guide. Their whole self-image changed because they had done some work of quality, and they were willing to dig into working on their literacy. And then when Larry was here founding High Tech High, he asked me to come out, and I brought, as Randy said, my big suitcase full of field guides and scientific papers and essays and projects that kids had done. And People here said, well, if middle school kids could do that, what could high school kids do? And Jay Vavra created the first of many field guides, seven field guides, I think, that have been created here for the ecology and the natural history and social history of San Diego Bay. And if you haven't seen this, there's no way you would think it was not done by adults. It's a fully, highly professional adult product, sells for like $25, forward by Jane Goodall made by students here. This idea that kids can do quality work and could start doing it now is really powerful. But let me jump back to my town for a moment. Of all the, of all the amphibians that kids studied in my town, the one that they were most attached to emotionally was this creature, the spotted salamander. They are an endangered species, and they were particularly endangered in my town because they breed in vernal ponds in the spring, they have to migrate down to those vernal ponds to lay their eggs. And they get run over by pickup trucks. So we had this protocol which we built, which was on rainy spring nights when they would migrate, we would take traffic cones and flashlights, and the kids and the parents and I would stand out and we would stop traffic, and we would carry the salamanders across the road and then let the traffic through. 
So it was a good service project, and it was a good sense of kids making a difference in the world, but it was really hard to teach the next day when you stayed up all night in the rain carrying salamanders. So the kids became a part of an engineering project, the world's first salamander tunnels. So these salamander tunnels go under the road, and the kids help build drift fences. Here are two salamanders coming out of the tunnel now. The kids built drift fences in the woods, like big Vs, that are like cattle fences, but they're only three inches tall. And the salamanders get funneled down, and they go under the, high, under the dirt road in these tunnels. This, this, these salamander tunnels, they're the only ones still in the world for salamanders. They, the kids got the idea from toad tunnels in England for toad migration. Um, and they're, it, they're one mile from my house, so I'm near this national landmark, just to say. Um, that. <laughs> This is right where I live. There is now a bluegrass band in Western Massachusetts called Salamander Crossing that are actually quite good. Um, we also, as uh, Randy mentioned, we thought if we don't have anyone in town to do the stuff we're supposed to do, why not have kids do it? So, over the course of my 25 years there, students tested every town, every home in town for radon gas and created this report about radon distribution in town, radon levels in town, and we actually found 14 homes with dangerous levels of radon and worked with those families and the state to get radon reme remediation done to make their houses safe for their kids. They tested the streams in town to make sure that the, the streams were safe for fish, and we worked with... Uh, national water, I mean, state water services to make sure that there was no pollution in our streams and so wildlife would be okay. We also tested everyone's well water in town. Everyone in town, including me, has a private well and people didn't know if their water was safe. We partnered with a college where students used, uh, they surveyed everybody in town, people talked about where their well was, they went, they spent three weeks at college working with college students using an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. That one machine cost more than anyone's house in my town. And the kids got to use that machine and they knew it cost more than their house. And they worked with college students and they came back with this incredible lesson, which was even though their parents didn't go to college, college was actually easier than they thought and that they could all go to college. In fact, they said college is easier than elementary school. And I said, tell me more. And they said, Mr. Berger, I don't want to sell out my college friends that are my mentors, but like, first of all, they sleep till noon lots of days. <laughs> they don't even have classes on Fridays. Like, they, they have days where they only have like an hour of a class. Like, they, our life is way harder. So they were all convinced that they could go to college, even if their parents had not. And they produced these. This is my letter, because I live in town. The student who wrote my letter, who used the mass spectrometer for my data source, said, Mr. Berger, do you want the bad news now or do you want to wait for your letter? And I said, tell me now. And she took me out in the hallway. And we now have a water filtration system in my home, thanks to my students. And then they created a website to share their data with the world. This is, again, like just students doing quality work. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I left that job. I didn't leave my town. I still live in the house I built there. My wife is still a nurse in town. But I was part of the founding of this organization, EL Education, Expeditionary Learning. And since that time, I've worked mostly in urban and rural settings around the country with public high schools and public middle schools and public elementary schools. Oh, I forgot. I, because I worked as a carpenter, for 25 years just to make a living, every one of my students had to learn carpentry. And we built so many outbuildings at my school. Whenever a recycling shed was needed, whenever any kind of thing was needed, in this case, this was a playhouse for the kindergartners that my students designed and built. And after school, they just worked and worked to build this stuff because, like, they wanted to build great things, whether it was a piece of writing they were doing or something they were building with their hands. It was about, are you doing good work? Are you creating something of value? My life is different now because I work with, often with urban districts. 
So let me just tell you the story of one urban district. The nearest city to me is Springfield, Massachusetts. You might know Springfield because the Basketball Hall of Fame is in Springfield. And uh, Springfield was a thriving industrial city 50 years ago. All of that industry has left, as you could imagine. It's part of that sort of northeastern and Rust Belt time where those jobs have all moved overseas or been eliminated by automation. So now it's a city with high unemployment, high poverty, and a very challenging school system. So Springfield has six high schools. In five of those high schools, only 62% of kids make it to graduation in an aggregate. That means 38% of them drop out. Right now in Springfield, Massachusetts, today on a Wednesday morning, not sure it's morning there anymore, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds, thousands perhaps, of high school kids that are unemployed. Unemployment rate is over 50% for high school teenagers. There, dropouts. What are they doing? They have no jobs? Like, what is their life for them? There is one high school in Springfield, bless you, that Springfield Renaissance School that we helped to start in my organization. It's a regular district high school. It's not a charter school. It's not a special school. It's not a uh, apply to get into it school. It's a regular public high school. It's got 700 students. They're the same low-income kids, mostly kids of color, as all the other schools. This school has a different approach. Kids do quality work in those schools. They are obsessed with doing high-quality work. The water testing project that my students did in my little town, these students did with a local pond. They did high-quality work that they shared regularly with their parents. That school has had 100% of its graduates get into college for the last 11 consecutive years. Let me say that again. 100% of students from this school have gotten into college. It's the same kids as the other five high schools in the city with an entirely different life outcome for those kids. Now, I'm going to be clear with you to say that not every one of those graduates goes to college. College is not actually the best choice for every kid. But every kid has that choice now. Every one of those kids can choose, does she or he want to go to college now, or do they want to go into military service? Do they want to go into a trade? Do they want to work for their parents' business? It wasn't society that said, you are a kid that can't go to college. They made that decision. Every year I go down to Renaissance on this day they call Declaration Day. Every one of those seniors gets up in front of the entire group, and the, everyone, the entire school, 700 kids, and says, my name is Jamal, here are the colleges I got into. This is what I'm choosing to do with my life. I'm going to attend this college, or I'm going to attend this technical program, or I've decided to join military service. This is my decision. And everybody cheers, and their parents cry, and the next kid gets up. And when you're a younger student, a freshman in this school, you watch that happen every year, and you think, that's going to be me. I'm going to get into college, and I'm going to make my choice of what to do with my life. Society is not making that choice for me. So, I want to show you a short video of that school. This video is not a professional video. It was made by one of my students at Harvard. I teach in the graduate school at Harvard now, and I have my students create films about projects. This student was interested in a water quality project done by freshmen at this high school. And he said, I want to create a video of it. And I said, you know, that project is so old, those kids are already out of college by now. You're not going to be able to find them. And he said, I'll find them. I'll make this video. So what you'll see is the story of that project, and you'll see the kids that are being interviewed now eight years, uh, nine years after they actually did the project. I'm just proud that I actually was part of the school. 
just knowing like all the changes that Renaissance have made in Springfield. We finally have a school in town that changed everything in the city. For these students, this first year at Renaissance was their first time really being asked to do work of, of high quality for an outside audience. This project was brought to our attention. We were like, what do they expect us to do with this big pond? Like we're 15 year old students. But we felt a lot of pressure. Um, they were depending on us to decide if this pond was swimmable or not. It was kind of like empowering, I guess. Like, oh, they're, you know, they're depending on this brand new school. You know, it's the first year. They're depending on us to give them the information that they're looking for. Each group had a specific section of the pond that we tested. So different groups had different areas of the pond that we were figuring out whether or not the pond was safe to swim. And that was sort of the ultimate type of responsibility that you can give to a group of students. We were told this is important. We're doing this for the community. You guys are responsible and we're going to present it. And some important people were going to come to this assembly and we were to present it as if it was a real setting. And it was a real setting. I actually live five minutes away from the pond, so I was actually excited to know what were going to be the results just because as a kid I used to walk around by the area with my mom and always wonder how come that pond was always closed. It was both the scientific content because they had to take the state exam at the end of the year uh, but also as a way to really engage them in the community and to be able to do scientific field work. I felt that that was an important skill that I wanted my students to have. It wasn't just a cool project, it was a cool project based deeply in the standards. We read primary sources, we read secondary sources, we read scientific text, uh, we read the Massachusetts water quality standards and made sense of them. I'm going to read something, I'm going to understand it, I'm going to use that with my field work and my field experiences, and I'm going to make sense out of that and, and, and apply it through my writing and show what I know through what I write. And that, to me, is deeply embedded in the Common Core state standards and deeply embedded in what it means to be college and career ready. It got us ready for the real world because me personally, I knew that in college deadline was very important and part of having a career is knowing that someone is going to hold you responsible. I think that students who are the most ready for college and for careers are students who have a variety of skills that they've learned in high school. Um, and Loon Pond was an example of a project that gave us different skills, um, whether it's testing water, or whether it's writing up the lab reports, editing the lab reports. It gave students different skills that they may not have normally got. At the end of the day, like, I was proud. I was proud of myself. I was proud of our class as a whole. Like, it, I mean, it came out really great. We presented it to the mayor of Springfield, and everyone was so impressed with us. During my undergrad, I had to conduct my own study. And I had to go out there, get approval, and then I had to start. So I had to collect data, do a chart just like we did for this project, and then the final goal was to have a final paper and present it to the whole school. So it was very similar. Our test results in that first year for the Science MCAS, um, they were significantly higher than the rest of the city. So whereas people thought like, oh, you know, that crazy school, well, all of a sudden that crazy school was getting good results. 
I ultimately want my students to believe in themselves and believe in themselves in a, in, in a myriad of ways. Um, and one of those ways is to believe that, that, that they're capable of, of whatever it is they'd like to do. I should be in Hollywood. We should all be in Hollywood. <laughs> Come on, class of 2010, let's do something. Okay, um, I'm going to pivot here to say, so far I've been talking about big projects. And many of you are disciplinary teachers where you think, I don't really have the power and scope to do a big project like that right now. And I want to make clear that my message today is not about big projects. It's about high quality work. If you're an English teacher, if you're a woodshop teacher, I'm not talking about you have to do something grand right now. I'm talking about can you carve out the space for your students to do work that they are incredibly proud of and that they will then share beyond their classroom. And that can be small things. I'm going to say that one structure that I would say everyone should consider in their schools is do you have a structure for kids to share their learning the things they're most proud of, beyond their teacher. Many of you do have that. That could be a student-led conference. It could be a presentation of learning structure. It could be an exhibition structure. The Springfield Renaissance School that's gotten every student into college every year, those students lead their own student-led conferences Multiple times per year as ninth graders, as 10th graders, as 11th graders, and as 12th graders. They publicly defend their work. And after 10th grade, and after high school, after 12th grade, they have to publicly present to their community. Their family is there, and the community is there, and educational experts are there, and they have to defend, I am ready for 11th grade, or I am ready for college. Let me just show you like 20 seconds of what that looks like with a student who's now in the business school at the University of Massachusetts, but was a 10th grader here. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you all for coming to my passage. This whole entire presentation is to prove to everyone that is here that I am ready for 11th grade. And I am in many schools with student-engaged assessment practices, Students reflect upon and communicate the scope of their learning and growth at the end of pivotal transition grades through passage presentations. Students present before members of their community. Teachers prepare students for success by providing organizers and rubrics and dedicating school time for preparing. Students share portfolios of work as evidence and the presentations reflect both academic and personal growth. You could say trash on Puerto Ricans. My motive is like proving the world wrong. I can be Puerto Rican, I can be a young woman and still go off to college, be a business manager or anything like that and do what I want to do because I worked for it. Though Passage presentations share these universal qualities, Passages take on unique characteristics in every school. So I'm going to stop there just to show you um, that story of Leonor, who's now a uh, uh, sophomore at University of Massachusetts School of Business, the Eisenberg School of Management, who as a 10th grader already thought, I can run my own business. Here she is already on her way there. The things that she shared in that presentation, and I was there for that presentation, we filmed the entire thing and we couldn't end up showing the entire thing because she started crying so much, and the audience started crying so much during her presentation that the video ended up being unusable, too personal and too tough. So we only have the opening for it in this video. 
But the things she shared in there were just the work from her classes as well as big projects. So if you're here and you're a history teacher, you're an English teacher, you're a teacher of ceramics or wood shop or metal shop or auto repair, those are the kinds of things she shared in her, in her presentation. This is the work I'm proud of. This is the work that shows you who I am. This is high quality work. It doesn't have to be grand projects. A similar structure is having the parent conferences run by students themselves. And let me make clear that this is how parent conferences were in my youth. When I was a kid, parent conferences happened only in elementary school, never beyond elementary school. And what a parent's conference was meant on one day during the year, my mother would go to school while I was home. Never my father, my mother, while my father was at work. And my mother talked to my teacher. I have no idea what they talked about. And the only possible outcomes was either I was in trouble or I wasn't. And when she came home, I learned if I was in trouble or not. In contrast, in our schools, parent conferences are K to 12, and they're run by the students themselves. So let me show you a moment of Gabriella presenting her work to her father. This is a school in Washington Heights, New York. It's 100% low income. 100% of the family speak Spanish at home. This is also a school that's gotten 100% of its graduates into college since the school opened, even though not every kid has chosen to go there. I should say proudly that one of those students, uh, Esteban Rodriguez, was uh, a guest of the Obamas at the, uh, his final State of the Union address and was called out in the audience as an example of how an immigrant to America can reach the American dream. I should tell you that his mother did not go on that trip to the White House because she was undocumented, and she took his brother instead. So here's Gabriella as a seventh grader, and I'll show you, I'll, this is a 20-minute parent conference, but I'll show you just about a minute or two of it, but you can get the sense of her pride in her work. Uh, Ms. Prominent, this is my father. Hi, nice to meet you. My pleasure. Um, Dad, this is my portfolio. This is gonna, I'm going to tell you about how well I'm doing. I just had my student life conference with my dad. We were talking about how good I'm doing, all my LTs I'm working on, my progress, and everything I'm doing good in my classes. Are there any that you're really proud of? Oh, I'm really proud of explaining what contact tools are because it's really simple and I think it is very important to have these conferences especially to learn and to see where our students stand as far as academic is concerned and it also helps us get involved in the education of our kids um this is my contact clues quiz See, these are the learning targets I can define vocabulary words and I'm Gabrielle, a science teacher I'm also her crew leader I really appreciate student-led conferences because it increases participation greatly. Our school has 100% participation in student-led conferences, which is great for every single student to be able to have a conversation with their parents or their family member and their teacher about their progress. I can apply self-selected vocabulary words to my writing. My writing. See, I've done really good. I only missed one question for defining contact tools, but either way, I'm really good at that. I'm a seventh grader, and I've done this student-led conferences like about three times, so I wasn't nervous. But when I was in, when I was a sixth grader, it was pretty nerve-wracking because it's just me talking to my dad while the teacher looks at me. So you get a sense of Gabrielle's pride in just sharing the work that she did formally. I wanted to give you an update on, on Gabrielle, which, uh, which is that um, Gabrielle is a senior at Washington Heights Exhibition and Learning School. She just sent me a project that she did uh, as a senior. I want to just show it to you. It's a two-minute video. I'm supposed to be motivational, but not even I am motivated to execute this speech. In all truth, 
I'm doing this for you guys for an English grade. But since I'm here dedicating about a week to making a two minute video, I might as well do my best on it. Now, let me tell you a story. When I was a freshman, yeah, one of you, I had to do a presentation for a charity I felt deserved a check for a lot of money. I worked with one of my best friends and a basketball jock, which was intriguing considering that I wasn't into sports and he was pretty good with hoops. But he was actually pretty cool, even when we were kind of different. Anyhow, for my presentation, our English teacher wanted us to do something out of the box. And I reluctantly decided to sing for our presentation because I wanted to win for us. And as much as I didn't want to, I kept my word. And I sang in front of the entire grade with nice clothing and full on stage fright. It was everything I imagined it to be. Awful and vomit triggering. But I did it. And then we lost. Everything happens for a reason. Heard that quote before, huh? Well, it's true. And sometimes those things aren't how you wanted things to turn out. But it did. And it'll bother you and attempt to break you down. Like homework on your shoulders, trying to flatten you to the ground. Or your parents being annoying because they took away your phone for being disobedient. But I promise you that everything that happens, happens for a reason. And that should only make you stronger. At this point, the grade doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that you guys take something from this speech. Anything. As long as it brings out your best and reflects that onto your grades. You are all fantastic. And I want you all together when you walk and get that diploma. I know it feels far away. And I know that means nothing considering I'm already here. But I believe in you. And you should too. Okay, that was her motivational speech for freshmen that you created this year. It, that, that piece of work is only a few weeks old, but I just got it, so I just wanted to share it with you because knowing Gabriella from seventh grade on, it's really neat for me to see her as a senior this year. Um, let me pause now. I've been sharing a lot of crazy stuff, and I'm inviting some pushback now. What's, what's resonating, but equally, what just seems nuts to you? Like, there's no way we could do those kinds of things in our school because of this. Or, that sounds really interesting, but it doesn't really relate to our challenges, our needs. Is there, or, maybe you do have a connection of, this connects for me, we're already doing that, and this really is working for us. Is there anyone, I, I will have some time at the end for questions too, but I also wanted to just stop for a moment and say, anyone want to push back? Any, please. Great question. So if you didn't hear that, the question was, the Springfield School, why is it not all the schools in Springfield doing this? I, I can tell you, that Springfield School gets visitors from all over the world. Uh, at the end of April, there'll be a two-day visitation for the school. From, people from all over America will come visit. You are welcome to visit. I will be there for two days. And people from all over the country come to admire their success. Within the city, people hate the school. I'm just going to be honest with you. It makes them look bad. People don't like the school and they have a lot of excuses about why it's not fair. And since that school opened, the city has been through five superintendents. I went to one of those superintendents and talked about our willingness to work with more schools. And he said, yes, I know that that's a great school, but we have six great schools in our city. And I thought, I understand why as a superintendent you'd have to say that in the public. But it's just you and me. Like, you don't have six great schools. You have one great school and five terrible ones. I didn't say that. But he said, I can't favor one school. I can't celebrate one school at the expense of my other schools in this district. So it was very challenging. There's still only one expeditionary learning high school in that city. Um, but there is a movement now, the new superintendent is asking us to work with more schools. So we're working with, in a smaller way, with four or five other schools in the city to support them. And my hope is that if this superintendent can last, which as you know, average tenure of a superintendent in this country is about three years, it's hard to keep the momentum, but I'm hoping we can do it. But it, it's harder than one might think. Um, 
I, I do want to acknowledge that the incredible beauty you see on this campus of all of these high-tech high schools is because of the genius of Larry Rosenstock and Ben Daly and Rob Reardon and uh, Laura and Randy and all the founders and leaders here, they've kind of built a wall of protection around this that allows them to do great work and experiment. And we don't all have quite that protection where we are. So it's going to seem, when you'll walk around here and see the students and see the work and think, oh my God, this is just impossibly good. And it's great because of the brilliance of this faculty and these leaders here keeping people out a little bit, allowing them some space to be creative and allowing students here to follow their passions, teachers to follow their passions and do great things. I have not had that privilege in the schools I work with. And so Springfield's a perfect example. We were able to do it in one school. We've struggled to even connect with a, another school. So uh, I wish we had the high-tech high cluster in Springfield like is here. I mean, I come here because it refreshes me to see a place where learning is the way it could be if we could just protect it. Great. Great. So if you didn't hear the question, it was, how can you possibly do student-led conferences or presentations of learning when you have 40 kids in a class and 500 to 2,000 kids in your school? It just seems logistically incredibly hard. It is logistically really hard. I don't want to minimize that because I work with large comprehensive high schools and, uh, and in public districts where we are trying to institute these things, and it is very tough. We actually have to fight to carve out the time for these things. But it's not impossible. It's just really tough. Um, let me give a, an example of a success story in that. So large middle school, eighth grade, wanted to institute between eighth and ninth grade a presentation of learning structure. This is Cooperstown, New York, which is a rural community. It's where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. If you've ever been to the Baseball Hall of Fame, you know half the income of that town comes from the Baseball Hall of Fame being there and all the Little League fields they've built around it where they have tournaments. And the other half is just a farming community. So it's one of those places that has a elementary school, a middle school, and a high school all on one campus. That's the entire school district. So between middle and high school, they wanted to set up a system of portfolio presentations like you see, a passage presentation between middle school and high school. But logistically, they thought, we have too many kids, we have too much to do. So we, we worked together with them to think, how can we downsize the size of the panels? How can we fit it all into one day? How can we build one release day? And we eventually built a structure which was all done on one release day. Each student pre prepared all year for his or her presentation, and their panel had one teacher, could be a high school or a middle school teacher, one community member, and one high school senior. And what was really interesting to us was that the eighth graders were more nervous about how the high school senior viewed their work than the adults. It's like the real pressure for them was that a high school senior was gonna be listening to them. Because that's the high status when you're an eighth grader. And all of those presentations happened in one day all over the school. And the seventh graders were the, the docents, they were the hosts, the welcomers, they had the refreshments, people came in, and we just shut down the school and did presentations all over the building for one day long, and it was an incredible celebration of student work throughout the, the town. It was like, but it was logistically very hard to plan, so I don't want to minimize how hard the logistics are to do these things. But they're not impossible. All right, I want to do one thing together with you, which is, I want to be totally, keep my integrity with, it's not about the scope of the project, it's about the quality. So I want to take a particular project that's not anything new, anything crazy, anything you couldn't do in your school, nothing that's connected to high tech high, nothing that's connected to a maker space. This is just a piece of high quality work. So I, have spent the last 40 years collecting high-quality work. 
And I built with my colleagues at ELN and Harvard a website called Models of Excellence with hundreds and hundreds of high quality pieces of student work in it. You can see we have resources about how to use quality work, we have projects, we have writing, we have videos, and stuff from all over the world. In fact, your schools could submit work anytime you want for this site. It's a highly curated site. Only the best things are accepted, like a poetry journal, but we would love to have work from your school. If you go to the project page, you'll find like 500 different projects from around the world from all different grade levels, 10th graders next to second graders next to 12th graders. I hope that these models will be useful to you. We also have a writing section, which is not interdisciplinary projects. It's just really good quality writing. Everything on this site is free and downloadable. I want to look together with you at one piece of student writing that we got just last year in the spring that changed my view of what a very traditional genre is, a high school history research paper. So here's the paper, actually it's an eighth grade, this one. Here's the paper, if I click on it here, it brings me to the page. In your booklet, you can find this piece. It's called Revolutionary Rum. So if you open your notebook to the page, I'm not sure where it is in there, but this page that says Revolutionary Rum, Oh, it's in the folder, I'm sorry, in the pocket folder on the left-hand side, behind that yellow schedule, there is a high school history paper called Revolutionary Rum. I would like to ask you to take three minutes to look at this paper, but I'm going to ask you to do something a little weird here. I'm going to ask you to start with the bibliography. So first, just read for a few minutes, the bibliography. And then I'm gonna ask you to read the first page of the paper. So go back to the bibliography, spend a minute or two just reading what's there. And take time to read some of her annotations. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to go and just read page one of her paper, which opens with Paul Revere's ride. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody at your table. Where do you notice quality in this piece? Either quality research or quality writing? <laughs> okay, I'm going to pull us back together for a moment. So, let me get a few volunteers willing to offer an insight. Where do you see quality either in the research or in the writing here? Anyone want to? Great. Be more specific. I didn't even know some of these facts that this student is presenting Great. in this paper. He's from Massachusetts. He didn't even know some of these facts. Let me tell you how much this paper blew me away. So, this was sent to me by an eighth grade eighth grade girl, Kaylin, she's now a ninth grade freshman, from a low income public district middle school in Durango, Colorado. <laughs> she's now a high school freshman and I'm still in touch with her via email. She said, I'm so honored you thought my paper was good. And I said, 
Kaylin, nothing I wrote in high school or college or graduate school is of this level. And it's not just that there are facts here that I didn't know. I thought, never in my life did I write a paper with an original historical thesis. Like, this is not someone else's thesis. This is her thesis, that rum was the cause of the Revolutionary War. And I thought, here's an eighth grader who's taking a bold step of saying, I have a different view of what caused the Revolutionary War than everything you've read, and in my paper, I'm going to convince you. And when I finished this paper, I thought, I think she's right. Like, an eighth grade girl changed my entire view of the seminal moment of American history. And she opens with Paul Revere's ride and mentions that he stopped to drink rum on his ride. And you know she didn't make that up, right? Like, holy mackerel for an eighth grade girl. It totally changed my view of what a research paper could be. Anyone else? Anything else you noticed in the research or the writing? Please. The variety of sentence structure that is like, you know, seniors couldn't do. It, it, she uses a variety of sentence structure that her seniors probably wouldn't do. I certainly didn't do it as a senior or college student. It reads like an article in a magazine that you want to read. I've been using this paper in high school classes, even AP history classes around the country since I got it last spring. And the students say, I've never been interested in a history paper before. Like, I'm not even interested in the history papers I write. And this one, I, I want to like, finish this one. Like, this one really is interesting. She creates powerful language that draws you in. Even though it's good history, it's also compelling to read. The bibliography totally floored me. This is what I thought. For 13 years and then four years of college and graduate school, I wrote bibliographies that meant nothing to anybody. They meant nothing to me. They meant nothing to my teacher. Nobody looked at them carefully. When I was in high school, they would look through to see how many sources I listed. And no matter how many sources I listed, everything came from the World Book Encyclopedia anyway, right? I just had to list other sources. Today, you could say the same for Wikipedia and then the other sources. When I read this, and then as a teacher, I assigned bibliographies for 28 years. And all I did was look to see, did they have a bunch of sources there? They were entirely a waste of time for the student and entirely a waste of time for me. I got this paper in the mail from Kaylin Waite last spring. I read her bibliography and I thought, why did it take me 40 years to figure out what a good bibliography could be? This bibliography actually shows you what she learned from each piece and you know she read each piece. She even lists things and say, I didn't actually use this in my paper, but it gave me the idea for this. Or in this piece, I got inspired to do this. Or in this piece, I got the idea for that. And I thought, I'm understanding her as a thinker and a researcher just from reading her bibliography. I thought, this is the way every bibliography should be always. And yet, I've been in education 40 years and I've never seen one quite like it. Now, I have to say this wasn't Caitlin's idea, Caitlin's idea to do that, but she does it beautifully. And it changes the paradigm for me of what a history paper can be. So I would recommend that you read the whole paper. I think it's a terrific paper. My wife, who's a nurse, she's not an educator, has no interest in any of the stuff I do, but she really got interested in this paper. Um, and she now agrees that rum was the cause of the Revolutionary War. <laughs> My point here is that you're going to be here in classrooms this afternoon. You're going to look around at projects done by these high-tech high students and be blown away. There's incredible work here. I'm blown away by the students here and the teachers here every time I'm here. And it is intimidating. But it's not about giant, crazy projects. It's about quality. You'll see quality here. We can create quality in our schools, even if that quality is just a paper that kids do, even if it's the playhouse that they build for the kindergartners. It's about the quality of what kids do, not the scope of that work that matters most to us. And in order to create engines for that quality, having students present their work, like Gabrielle did to her dad in that, as a seventh grader, builds that sense that someone cares that my work is high quality. Someone is going to look at that work. And so whatever your discipline is, I'm going to 
tell you this, you have to figure out how to get off the treadmill of coverage to carve out some time to do some things really well. Everything in society is pushing us to rush and cover a million things, way more than we can possibly do. And you feel like, how could I ever do a, anything that well because I always have to cover too much? Well, you have to, and pardon me if you're an administrator in this room, but you have to like, don't even tell your administrator. But get off syllabus. Take a break and do something really well, and your administrator, your school leader will be so proud when parents are excited and kids are excited that they had the time to do one thing well. Here's my story about coverage. True story of my life. My father worked for this, in the same chemical plant for 47 years. His entire life, he worked in the same chemical plant. Hardly anyone today has a job that they'll have for their whole life. Almost no young people will do that. But back then, you stayed in your same job because you got a pension. And once you were done, you could retire and you were fine. So my father worked in a chemical plant for his entire life. He retired at age 68. And his plan was he and my mother were going to travel around the world with his pension. He died at age 69. So he didn't have a long retirement life. But during that one year when he was retired, he and my mother had the best year of their entire life. And they actually did travel around the world in different places. So they called me up and they said, we just got back from Europe, you have to come see our pictures. Now this is before the internet, it's before digital photography. They meant pictures, right? Like the kind that you get back from the drugstore. And they said, you have to see our pictures of Europe. So I said, okay, I got in my pickup truck, I drove to their house, their entire dining room table was covered with photographs. And I started looking at them and I noticed that almost every photograph was from a train window, right? It was like framed by a train window and they were all kind of blurry. There were castles, churches, town scenes, all like blurry in the train window. And then I learned that my parents did a package deal, 14 countries in 12 days. And so they started sharing me the pictures and they said, this is Italy. And my father was like, no, I think that was Switzerland. My mother was like, no, 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 it was Germany, I think. And that was the way of every picture. Like, they could not tell what country they were in when that picture was taken. I, they had a wonderful time. But if you had given them an assessment about Europe afterward, they wouldn't have done so well. Right? Because, and I had this revelation at that moment. Like, that was my entire public school education, was on that train whizzing by quadratic formulas, civil war, colonial era, just like choo, choo, choo. It was just like we were always on that train of covering, covering, covering. And I thought, what if my parents had been on that European tour and they had seen five countries instead of 14? And what if they had stopped in Italy for three days and gotten off in Florence and seen the Uffizi Gallery and had an Italian meal and met some Italian folks, they would have come back and said, oh my God, Italy's the coolest place in the world. The food was so great. The people were so great. We can't wait to go back to Italy. We learned about our own culture from learning about Italian culture. Like even in three days, it kind of changed us. They couldn't say that to me because they had actually not spent three days in Italy because they were on that train whizzing through Europe. Here's my message to you. It's okay to be on the train sometimes. It's okay to be taking your students through country after country some of the time. But for goodness sake, like stop in Italy for three days sometime. Do one project in your shop class, one paper in your English class, one scientific study in your science class where you think nobody's going to know this, but I'm going to take longer on this one. I'm going to do it well. We're going to do multiple drafts. We're going to do critique. We're going to have an audience from it. We're going to do it really well. And at the end of the year, kids are going to think, I can't believe I did this. Everything in America is telling you not to do that. It's telling you to rush and cover and prepare for tests and get ready. And you have to decide, I'm going to hide from there. They're all wrong, and they are wrong. And we are going to spend a few days in Italy this semester. So it doesn't mean changing everything you do, but it means giving the chance for your students to do some beautiful work in whatever discipline you work in. And so that at the end of the year, you'll be proud, they'll be proud. Yes, please. I have a, a question about that. I recently ran into a former student. He had been 22, he has a degree in, he's a 
engineering, uh, philosophy, and uh, history. He's got three majors in, in college, and he's working for a, um, a government contractor in, Anyway, we were talking about the common core, and he said, well, I don't like the idea that if people would slow down and actually spend more time to be slowing it down, because his perception, because he's so incredibly intelligent, is that the more you cover, the more you learn. So my question is, for our, our students like that, and what are the systemic story of your kid, obviously, but for our students like that, how do you accommodate you know, spending that time for our students who are already writing the paper, you know, draft? Great question. So that'll be my last question. What about the students who are doing really well, who are accelerated, who, who need the challenge, who want to speed up? I would say the same thing applies to those stronger students, which is those stronger students may be able to cover more material, but in service of creating what? Like, have them cover more material to create an even greater project, an even greater paper, something that they are, are that proud of. Um, it's, the, it's like, by the end of the year, you should think, did my students do anything in this year that I am really proud of and they're really proud of? And if you can say yes, I think that's where you should be. Um, I got here yesterday on a, a flight and found that one of my former fifth and sixth grade little twerky kids from my town in the middle of nowhere was here interviewing for a teaching job here. And I still have videos of her disco performance <laughs> back when she was a sixth grader. And they said, oh my God, she was so articulate, she was so together, and I just thought, man, it just makes me proud to have this former little country girl who became a disco queen in my class, in my disco lessons that I taught her, now applying for a teaching job here at High Tech High. It's really about like, if I showed you that clip, you'd think, that girl is a good disco dancer, right? I mean, it's about the quality of what you do. And when you do things of high quality, that pride changes who you are as a person. It just gives you a new sense of what you can do. So I admire you all for sticking with public education in this moment where public education is under fire in this country. My life now is dedicated to supporting people like you who are standing up for public education when we most need it. And I hope that you are going to find work in your schools that you're so proud of that you're going to send it to me, you're going to submit it to the Models of Excellence website, and that next year you'll, you'll be bringing people online to that website and saying, see this project? This is from our school. See that writing? That's from our students. I hope that the resources there are useful to you, and I hope that any of EL's work, if it can be of use to you, could be used. Oops, sorry. So in closing, that's my pop, sorry. In closing, uh, we have four books that we've written uh, about assessment, about projects. We can't give these away, I'm sorry, because we have a publisher, right? And they, we just, but if those books are ever useful to you, these are books about this approach to education that we're trying to spread around the country we have about 200 videos of great instructional practice, all of which are free and open source. Other than our books, everything we have is free. We're a nonprofit just trying to spread this word. We have the Models of Excellence website that I hope you'll want to submit work to. And those are the URLs in case any of that would be useful to you. So I'll be here for two days. Very happy to dig in with you on any of this work. Um, and I want to thank you for your keeping the flame alive for public education. Thanks.